Man, what a crazy two years it has been. Who knew that early time-restricted feeding could lead to all this? Guys, girls, you beautiful creatures of planet Earth, welcome back to another week of How to Health, How to Eat edition. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic manner. So it's been two years, and I thought it would be a good chance to take a step back, talk about some of the things I've observed, and primarily, four things that I've noticed on my own early time restrictive feeding journey that could potentially help you out on yours or your time restricted feeding, your intermittent fasting, your prolonged fasting, whatever. Whatever you're embarking on or thinking about embarking on, I hope this can give you some insights and some data to help make the right decision for you. So it was about two years ago, time flies when you're eating early where I really started locking in my time-restricted feeding regimen. Slowly but surely, week by week, month by month, shrinking that eating window until I got to the timing that I was comfortable with. And for me, that is primarily an 18-6 protocol, fasting 18 hours a day and feeding six hours a day. Now, during this time period, I was also digging into research around circadian rhythms or our natural sleep-wake cycles our internal body clock. Little did I know that these circadian rhythms and our sleep cycles have some rather interesting interdependencies with the food we eat and specifically our meal timings. Data was beginning to trickle out supporting the hypothesis that humans were better equipped to metabolize food earlier in the day rather than later in the day. And when you think about this concept from an evolutionary perspective, it kind of makes sense. Through the millions of years of evolution and the 300,000 plus years of the Homo sapien evolution, I'd say it's pretty unlikely that they had three structured meals a day. And even more unlikely that they waited till 7 p.m. to gather the tribe together and have one massive kumbaya. More realistically, early humans ate when food was available, when they could find it. You know, probably when there was light during the day. I just don't think the iPhones had the flashlight feature just yet back then. I could be wrong, but I'm just pretty sure they did it. Now with that thought in mind, take into account how slow evolution is. In the grand scheme of things, it has only been a tick on the evolutionary clock since that wise guy Edison invented the light bulb. Uh, what's that? W what's that thing you're working on? Well, it's a light bulb and- a Light bulb! Light bulb! Yeah, I invented that! Highly controversial, by the way. And social nightlife really became mainstream. I bet Edison would like credit for that. Either way. So with that evolutionary background, I want to take you to the research that are reviewed in this video right here around early time restricted feeding in a human model. What did we see? In this small study in which an intervention group ate between the hours of 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. and were compared to the control group, which had a normal 12 hour feeding window, the early time restricted feeding group showed improved 24 hour glucose, an increase in insulin sensitivity, better cortisol alignment, an increase in circadian gene expression, higher evening BDNF in the brain, as well as an increase in longevity gene expression. 
all from eating earlier in the day. I mean, these two groups, the ETRF group and the control group, both ate the same foods and the same amount of calories. The only thing that differed was the time and day they were consuming them. Super interesting. Again, this study was rather small. It had a bunch of limitations, but interesting nevertheless. So without this research to influence my decision back in early 2018, I embarked somewhat kind of blindly into this early time restricted feeding protocol. So let's touch on what was consistent throughout. Over the past two years, I followed the 18-6 early time restricted feeding protocol. So when I ate, I ate between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. and fasted for 18 hours. And my normal eating protocol was plant-based whole foods throughout the two years. That stayed consistent. Now what changed a little bit were some of the regiments within that. Now what do I mean? So there were a couple of months where I was strictly plant-based keto vegan. So I went on a strict plant-based keto diet for about four months or so. And then more recently for about the last six months, I've been following an ETRF, early time restricted feeding alternate day fasting protocol. Now that's a lot of words, but it's essentially exactly what it sounds like. So I ate every other day, but on days that I ate, I started eating at 9 a.m., finished at 3 p.m., and it was a plant-based whole food diet. Make sense? Cool. So that's been like the last six months, and I'm kind of finishing up on that now. We'll touch on um, some of the results and observations in a video to come. And then lastly, there are a number of more extended fasts throughout. So a bunch of three to eight day fasts, water only, full clean out of the system, that kind of stuff. And obviously I just didn't eat during those fasts. So there was no protocol to follow except drink a lot of water and pee a lot. Anyhow, I will say things got extra interesting when I started using this, the Aura Ring, uh, about a year ago, just did a full year sleep tracking review up here. But about a year ago, I got the Aura Ring and I've been tracking my sleep every single night since. And you can see the difference that your eating makes on the quality of sleep and we'll uh, that might be one of the observations. We'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. So here are my four subjective and objective observations from two years of early time restricted feeding. But real quick, first, just wanna voice that if you are following some sort of eating regimen or protocol and it works for you, there is no reason whatsoever to change that. Everyone is currently in a unique set of circumstances. It's called life. We each have different daily dependencies that dictate and shape the actions we take and the regimens that we follow. And a healthy lifestyle can really be shaped around all situations. There's no need to sacrifice the things that are most important to you. So I suggest you don't do it. If dinner is the only time you get to sit down and talk to your family because you're at work all day and you want to enjoy a nice family meal, do it. That is totally fine. You need to fill this up right here first and then you can build and piece together a healthy strategy around that. It just takes a little figuring out. And hopefully some of the content on this channel helps you do that and makes you smile. All right, enough with the sappy stuff. I'm sorry, I got a little sappy. Sometimes you gotta get a little sappy. Here's what I observed from the past two years of early time-restricted feeding. Number one. You guessed it, because someone gave you a hint before, and that is improved sleep. Now, even though I didn't have my pre-early time restricted feeding sleep data from the Aura Ring, I can tell you just from me playing around with the different fasting protocols, the prolonged fast, and getting dragged out to a handful of later in the evenings, much later than I would have wanted dinners, that the earlier I finish my last meal, the better overall quality of sleep I had. Plain and simple, plain and simple. Both from the objective data and the subjective feel, I noticed that deep sleep, REM sleep, heart rate variability, and heart rate were 
all improved when I finished eating earlier in the day and on the other hand were drastically impaired when I was dragged out, kicking and screaming, forced to have a late meal. I go deep into a number of different sleep statistics in a bunch of different videos around sleep and fasting. If you really wanna get into the weeds, check them out, links below. I will save the rest of you who are not trying to go play in the weeds. Other things on sleep. Subjectively, I just feel so much more energized in the morning after finishing my meal earlier in the day. Compared to feeling drowsy, tired, and really just wanting to bundle back under the covers on those mornings after a late night meal, or even worse, some alcohol. Again, I touch on that in the videos below. Alcohol, sleep, killer. Moving on, observation number two, and that is around digestion. You couldn't see me, let me. Digestion. This was an interesting one, and one that I really didn't know what to expect, but I think it's been evident and clear that I've had improved digestion from starting this protocol. Now, when I break this down, it goes as follows. I eat my meals earlier in the day. My biggest meal is either breakfast or lunch, typically breakfast, to tell you the truth. And it's really based on a two meal a day strategy with a few snacks here and there. By eating my largest meal earlier in the day, after 18 hours of fasting, this means I'm not eating and just plopping my ass on the couch and watching some TV and taking a nap, which used to be how I would operate with a large meal at dinner. Instead, I'm moving, taking on whatever the day has in store. Research has indicated that light movement after meals aids digestion, and light movement is basically a guarantee after either of my meals, breakfast or lunch. And wouldn't you know it, by 6 or 7 p.m. that night, that food has traversed the intestines and it's in the colon and it's pretty much ready for the end of its journey. I mean, the microbes are feasting down a little bit on it, but other than that, light on the other end of the tunnel, see ya. Now I will add that, like I said before, I follow a plant-based lifestyle. So that is typically high in dietary fiber, a nutrient that most people in the Western world are highly deficient in. This, in my own opinion, is why the food makes its way through the digestive system, my digestive system, you know, rather quickly. So basically every night my intestines are mostly cleared, letting my digestive system rest and my body focus on what it's supposed to be focusing on and that recovery and regeneration. You know, what sleep is all about. But too many times we impair our sleep because we have a late night meal and our digestive system is working the majority of the night, demanding a high amount of blood flow to break down food and not letting our body properly recover and regenerate for the next day. And the cycle continues. So early time restricted feeding, improved my digestion, improved my sleep. Moving on to number three. And this one is again an interesting one. And it's the noticeable shift in hunger patterns. Now, this is something that two years in, I've taken pretty much for granted. But when I put myself in myself's shoes, two years ago, I do recall, you know, it was an initial challenge. Our bodies are very smart, they're highly adaptive, and it gets used to certain patterns that we give it each and every day. So a pattern interrupt, especially something, you know, that is survival dependent, like food, is something your body, you know, kicks and screams a little bit about. So something that I noticed throughout this past two years was a evident shift in the points in the day where I am actually hungry. Once upon a time, I was hungry, you know, kind of all throughout the day. You know, the typical stuff, emotional eating, stress eating, all culminating with an oversized late night dinner and possibly a little post-dinner ice cream. I mean, have, if you had an ice cream, you know what I'm talking about. Now we fast forward to today and I don't have the slightest inkling of any hunger sensations after 3 p.m. My body over the last two years has adjusted, and I'd say it actually happened in a couple of months, but it has adjusted to knowing that its last nourishing meal is gonna be around 2, 2.30, and then it's not gonna get nourishment again until 9 a.m. the next day. 
And the funny thing is the way I actually really noticed this and noticed that there was a shift was from doing prolonged fast. So not eating for an extended period of time. It, it could have been a three day fast. It could have been a seven day fast. It could have been somewhere in between, but it was pretty evident throughout my prolonged fast when I would feel the most hunger sensation. And wouldn't you know it at 9 a.m. every single day, my mouth would start salivating a little bit. My tummy would start grumbling a little bit. And I'm sure if I had a way to measure it, and I think I actually have this data on glucose, but I'm, my glucose was probably elevated and my insulin was probably elevated. Getting ready for that meal. However, later in the day, whether it was day one, two, three, or seven of the fast, the evening was a piece of cake. You, you know what I mean. And to me, this just speaks to how adaptive as organisms we are. And the fact that the majority of obstacles that we believe are physiological are really psychological. So if you think you can't do something, especially when it comes to adjusting your eating habits, I, I got a little secret for you. You can. And we're bringing this home with the last observation number four and that is it gets easier just like anything new that you're doing for something other than pleasure it kind of sucks in the beginning but before you know it it's the new norm and by deploying this discipline in the form of routine you slowly create a habit this habit turns into a lifestyle and then it turns into the new norm and you are coasting and then it's not that hard you don't need discipline because it's part of you. I don't even think about it anymore. It just happens. And obviously you got to balance things out. You know, you can't be super, super strict, but you always have that lifestyle to fall back on. This is the main way you conduct business and you can deviate as the situation calls for it. Constant game of balance. Once you build a routine of it, you will be chugging along the ETRF train or whatever eating regimen train of your choice in no time. And just like any other form of time-restricted feeding or intermittent fasting, because you have this shortened window, it promotes the consumption of good, real, nourishing foods during your eating opportunity. Not crap. That's gonna make you feel like crap. So just like anything, over time, we adapt and it becomes easy. It becomes the new norm. And you're gonna look back two years from the day you started, probably a lot sooner, probably a couple of months, and you're gonna be like, geez Louise, shit was easy. And that's the way the cookie crumbles. The organic oatmeal cookie, homemade. So there you have it. Two years of E-T-R-F and kicking. I say this in some way, form, or fashion in pretty much every single one of my videos, but it's so important, I continue to reiterate. You know the rule of seven, like it takes seven times for someone to hear something to actually, you know, get it, understand it, remember it. I do the rule of like 77. So I'm just gonna keep pounding this home. And that is whatever point you are at in your life, right here, right now is the perfect time to start investing in your health. No, it doesn't mean you have to jump on the ATRF bandwagon. It solely means that you are making intentional change that serves you and your health goals. We are our most valuable assets. You gotta invest daily. ETRF has continued to serve me and my life well, so I plan to keep the ETRF party going. Invitation's open.